We're now counting the economic cost of this. We're starting to get more and more data. The U.S. has had their first quarter out a, a, a decline of 4.8%. I'm showing you here the consumer spending component of the U.S. economy, a very substantial decline. You can see relative to what happened at the time of the financial crisis, this was a way more of a significant event. I would just stress, though, that this is only the start of the decline. This is the first quarter of the year. It was only badly affected by the March number. If you look at consumer spending, it was actually good in January and February. So the next time you see this number, it is going to be a massive decline. We're talking about GDP in the U.S. declining by somewhere between 20 and 30 percent uh, quarter on quarter in the second quarter. So the numbers are going to get a lot worse. This is just a precursor to that. We also watching the whole range of what we call fast economic data, data that comes out either daily or weekly. And all of those numbers are, are now presenting for April. So they give us an idea of how this is all going to pan out. And you can see the numbers look dramatic. This is a chart showing the number of people who are claiming unemployment insurance on an ongoing basis. That number now sits at almost 19 million people. We'll get an update on U.S. unemployment in the next day or two. I'm expecting that the next number will show that something like 20 million people have lost their job in April alone. Uh, so the U.S. unemployment numbers are going to look substantially worse as we get to the real uh, heart of the damage caused by this virus. Uh, if you look at airline travel, those numbers still look incredibly weak, down 95 percent. Obviously, there's some stability at that level of weakness. So the next move from here naturally has to be an improvement. We're not really seeing it yet in the data, but we'll monitor this on a daily basis. So as I say, the numbers look extremely weak. Uh, for the year as a whole, we're looking for almost a 6% decline in the U.S. economy. And then some sort of rebound next year, probably around 25 to 3%. That doesn't take the U.S. back to where it was before the crisis started, but uh, it's all going to take longer than you think. And the main reason is that you can't remove the lockdown measures instantaneously. They have to be scaled back over a period of time. And even when you've removed the measures, there's no doubt that it's going to take time for companies to get back to work. Uh, they're clearly not going to re-employ all of the people that they lost uh, during uh, the peak of the crisis. Uh, so you can't expect a very sharp rebound in economic activity it's all going to have to take uh, a couple of years to get back to where we were before the crisis uh, hit. The U.S. Uh, continues to try and respond as best as they can in terms of supporting the economy. They've cut interest rates basically to zero. They use a range of zero to a quarter percent, so they're unlikely to cut further than this. This is pretty much the lowest rate they can be at. The government has uh, also provided this rescue package of $2.2 trillion. Uh, in many of these uh, areas, they've actually now run out of money and they're looking to add to this. And $2.2 trillion represents more or less half of the government's annual budget. So U.S. government debt is going to look uh, significantly higher the next time we see that data. And then in addition to that, the U.S. Federal Reserve continues to print money at a, on a never-ending basis. In other words, they have introduced open-ended uh, QE, and in the last four or five weeks, they have added way more than two trillion U.S. dollars. And if you're watching the currency market, you'll know that uh, the dollar is still behaving uh, in a fairly uh, strong way. So there's no sense that this additional liquidity is in any way undermining the value of the dollar. And that speaks to uh, just the psychology of how people see the dollar. So I think this type of printing by the Fed will continue on. Uh, there's no target. There's no limit to this. They will simply do whatever is required to support the economy while you wait for uh, the virus to be brought under control and ultimately for the lockdown uh, requirements to be lifted and try and get the economy functioning. If we turn our attention to Europe, you can see the start of their numbers. They've also had their first quarter GDP. This is not presented as a annualized number. This is merely quarter on quarter. So if you annualize this number, it would be equivalent to a decline of about 15 percent. Uh, so you can see the, the level of the fall off relative to the financial crisis, uh, really extreme. Again, I would just highlight that this is only the start. 
Uh, the next time you see this number, it's probably going to be in the order of a 20% decline. Uh, Europe uh, very badly affected. And while they seem to be getting on top of the numbers now, the damage caused in the first half of the year, uh, very substantial. And you can see what that's done to uh, what we call economic sentiment or confidence in Europe. You can see how sharply it's fallen off in the last month or so. And again, I would stress that this is just the beginning of the decline. These numbers are going to get worse, particularly as the unemployment rate picks up. There's a link between confidence and unemployment. So all of the data that you've seen coming out of Europe and the United States uh, looks extremely bad. And there's no doubt that those economies are going to be incurring a very deep recession. If we turn our attention to China, they've also had their first quarter GDP. It was a decline of almost 10%. Again, this is not annualized. So if you annualized it, you would end up with about a decline of 35%. So in the first quarter, you can say that the Chinese economy fell by 35% quarter on quarter. That is massive for a country that is used to very robust growth. The encouraging uh, news for China is that they continue to ease back on the lockdown uh, restrictions. They are getting their economy back into functioning. They sit still at around 80% back to normal. But if you look at their manufacturing PMI very sharply down in February, which was obviously the peak of the crisis of the virus infections for them, but in March it moved back above 50 and that has held importantly in April. So manufacturing on the face of it looks to be recovery within China. And you can say the same thing for the services, which is things like uh, retail activity, banking activity, all of those things sharply down in February, a nice recovery in March that continued on into April. Now, on the face of it, this should give us an idea about how other economies can perform, because obviously China was the first affected by the virus. The problem is that China is misleading in terms of the information, so we can't trust exactly what they're producing. And in particular, we can't trust it when they say that they haven't seen a resurgence in infections. And that's really the test. Can you get your economy going? Can you remove your lockdown restrictions without uh, incurring an escalation in infection rates? On the face of it, China seems to be able to do that. But as I say, we can't trust the infection numbers. And that, I must say, is incredibly unhelpful at the moment. So those are what the, my world growth numbers look like. Every major economy is going to have a recession this year. The extent of that recession will be severe by historical standards. Uh, for example, the world a decline that will be the sharpest, most severe decline in the world economy since the Great Depression in the late 1920s, early 1930s. And then as you ease the lockdown measures, you should see some form of recovery in 2021. The pace of that recovery is going to be determined by whether or not the infections can be kept under control. And in that sense, the vaccine, I think, is going to play a critical role. If we can deliver a global vaccine early next year, that would help with the recovery because it would give everybody a lot more confidence. If we turn our attention to South Africa quickly, we're now looking at a 6% decline, followed by some form of recovery over the next two years. That recovery, I would argue, is still fairly muted, doesn't take us back to the level we were at in 2019. So a lot of damage being incurred in South Africa in the first half of the year. Again, our numbers when we get to the second quarter GDP could be a decline in the order of 30%. Now, in the press, you've seen numbers that are a lot worse than minus 6%. And it's quite easy to get to those worse numbers if you assume that the lifting of our lockdown measures becomes problematic. Maybe the infections rise too much. Maybe we forced back into more lockdown restrictions. Then obviously the economic data is going to look uh, quite damaging. We don't really have what's called fast economic data. We don't have daily and weekly economic data, but uh, we tend to rely more on the monthly data. And one of the numbers we focused on now is the vehicle sales because that is an April number and it gives us an idea of just how bad April was. And what vehicle sales are recording is a decline of 99%. Uh, if you look at um, passenger sales as a, as a separate category, that was a decline of almost 100%. So it's telling you we're still selling some commercial vehicles, but in essence, the motor industry came to a halt uh, 
in April, and hopefully they can start to get some sort of recovery going over the next couple of months. But clearly, that is going to take some time before this market's anything back to where it uh, ought to be. So those are the types of numbers that you've got to factor into uh, the forecasts. We also expect that over the year, we're going to lose 1.7 million jobs in total. Uh, and you can see I'm estimating that those job losses will be across every single sector, a bit concentrated in things like uh, retail trade and the accommodation, the uh, tourism industry, some in construction, some just generally in business services. We do think it's going to impact the informal sector a bit more harshly, particularly um, individuals trading uh, as a one man business. Uh, also, we think it will impact small business quite severely. Bigger business can withstand this a little bit better. But this is a significant decline. If you consider that during the financial crisis, we lost a million jobs. This is 1.7 million jobs. Again, these numbers could look a lot worse if the economic decline is extended all throughout this year and into next year. So the risks are very clear. Uh, if we can't uh, start to ease the lockdown measures. We also think that uh, the budget uh, is going to suffer from a tax revenue shortfall. At this stage, we're estimating somewhere between 70 and 80 billion rand shortfall. Clearly, that also could be a lot worse if the economic decline is more severe. And uh, yesterday, the Revenue Service put out some data showing that it's possible that tax revenue could have a shortfall of 285 billion. Now, if you think where 285 billion is on this chart, it gives you some idea of the numbers that the Revenue Service has been playing around with. But in order to get that severity of a decline, clearly the economy has got to be in this severe lockdown all of this year uh, and into the early part of next year, which is not our base case. As it stands, 70 to 80 billion uh, will add a lot of pressure to government finances. We're looking at a budget deficit that now jumps to 12% of GDP. Normally, you would want this number to be mo no more than 3 or 4%. Obviously, that 12% government is going to have to finance, which means government's going to have to borrow additional money. All of that means that government debt is on its way up. It's now going to comfortably be over 70 percent and it's heading to 80 percent. And you can see how government debt has changed very dramatically just in two years. And that's uh, partly our own doing and partly the virus doing. And so this debt excludes uh, the debt held by the state owned enterprises. So you would have to add on top of this the debt from Eskom Transnet SAA. When you put those numbers on top, you end up over the next two years, three years, getting to a debt level of well over 90% of GDP. And clearly that's not affordable for South Africa. So the message coming back to the government is firstly, they need outside help. And so they're going to go to the IMF to get some support but it's going to have to require way more than just a bit of outside help. South Africa has to dramatically find a way to increase the level of growth, increase tax revenue, increase employment. And that's ultimately going to be South Africa's challenge once we get the virus more under control. With that in mind, it's no surprise that uh, the credit rating was to, uh, revised down further. Recently, S&P took us down another notch to now be uh, min double B minus, that is three notches below investment grade that's deep into junk territory, you would now say it's more than a decade if South Africa starts to do things right before we back at investment grade. All of this means that we're going to struggle to raise international finance. We're going to the cost of raising money by government is going to become more expensive. And it adds to the challenge that the South African economy and the South African government is facing. It also tells us that ultimately the currency will remain under pressure because we've got to find a way to fund this. And if we're not deriving better economic growth, who's going to have confidence in investing in government? So if you then look at um, the response from government, obviously they're cutting interest rates that will help at the margin. Uh, we think there's room to cut rates again, somewhere between 50 and 100 basis points still from here. That's partly because inflation should remain well under control. We've got a big petrol price effect coming through, so that'll push inflation lower. So I think the Reserve Bank can afford to cut rates a bit. Obviously, the government has put in place the 500 billion support program. I think the design of this program is good. The structure is good. 
They're targeting trying to help small, medium business through the banking sector, and they're also trying to provide some socioeconomic support to those people who get social grants or are unemployed, etc. So I think that design is exactly right. The question is, can they deliver it? And we can see from general a news report that there are problems in making this delivery effective. Uh, how are they going to fund the 500 billion? Well, they're going to take 130 billion from other government departments and reprioritize that spending. I think that is achievable. There's quite a lot of spending that I think government can pull back on under current conditions without too much of an effect and then channel that into more appropriate spending. They're going to raise around 80 billion from the IMF in terms of the IMF's emergency funding for COVID-19. Now that will that will be available to South Africa with very few conditional conditions attached to it, which means that uh, we would, wouldn't have to really change policy uh, in order to get this IMF funding. More than 100 countries have applied for IMF funding so far. We're also going to get uh, some money from the New Development Bank, which is part of the BRICS Bank. That's 1 billion US dollars. We're entitled to that money automatically because we are a BRICS member, so we shouldn't have problems there. And then in addition, they'll use some of the UIF uh, pool of money, which is fairly substantial, and then they'll have to borrow some additional. So all of this is putting huge strain on government, partly because uh, you're going to see an increase in unemployment, partly because you're going to see a big drop off in tax revenue, partly because government has to support the economy through these spending programs. Now, that all seems worthwhile if we can get the virus under control and then most critically find a way that we can uh, start to lift the growth rate. And for me, this brings home the message very clearly. If you look at foreign ownership of South African government bonds, it has been systematically dwindling. At some point, foreigners owned more than 42% of government bonds. The latest number, which is an April number, sees it down at just over 32%. And you have to ask yourself, what is the rationale for foreigners owning South African government debt and therefore ultimately supporting the currency? And clearly, if we can't show that we can get this economy functioning better, that we can get on top of all of these uh, challenges, then foreigners will question their willingness to own uh, South African government debt. And that longer term does imply some underlying weakness for the exchange rate. Obviously, if you look at the exchange rate where it is now, it is significantly undervalued. So you could make an argument in the short term, there may be some buying opportunities. But when you focus further out, the real focus has to be, can South Africa try and get on top of all of these bad numbers, show that we can implement some significant policy changes, show that we can lift growth and employment, and then from there you would expect the currency to rally as foreigners buy in. But that's a big question mark, and that ultimately will be the focus. Part of that is political. Hope that provides you with some update on where we are now. A lot of this news is negative. We're in the heart of the bad economic data, the data is going to get worse in the in the short term. I think systematically the world is getting on top of this virus. So we're moving to the next phase, which is can we remove the lockdown measures, get the economy going while we still control the spread of the virus.